And uh, so moving on to, I'm going to talk about uh, organisation and uh, Enola Gay, which is, happens to be... We're only up to the second album, folks. <laughs> better make yourself a coffee and get a pillow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, yeah, because this happens to be probably my, one of my personal favourites. With Enola Gay, um, where did the, uh, the idea for the song come from? How did it come from? Um, Paul and I were real anoraks. He used to build model trains, <laughs> and I used to build model aircraft. <laughs> um, I was fascinated with warfare, mm. largely because I'm not a black and white person, and I can't believe the extremes that people are allowed to go to in warfare. The, mm. the, 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 the excuse of brutality, it's just horrendous, but it's like a moth to a flame. I'm yeah. kind of fascinated by it. So if you become interested in warfare, you become interested in the aeroplane that dropped the atom bomb that mm. e effectively ended the Second World War, and that's, that's why uh, I wanted to write about it. Again, it goes back to this sort of, you know, wanting to do something different. Mm. And was it, I can imagine it was a rather cool moment when, you, uh, when they said they were going to play it at the Olympics. I really didn't think they would do it. I, <laughs> I, I, I thought, what are the Japanese going to think at the start? <laughs> um, you know, in the music industry, you never believe you've got mm. to do something until you've done it. And they asked if they could use it. I was like, yes, please. Um, and then, I mean, I did know that Danny Boyle was a fan because mm. I'd done a piece of music for a TV series for him like 20 years earlier. Okay. So I knew he was a fan, but, but when they asked for it, yeah, I was, yeah. I mean, to sit there and watch, uh, and it wasn't <laughs> just in the 80s medley, it was right up at the front yeah. of the whole music thing. I was just like, ah. Oh. Yeah, I was extremely flattered <laughs> and honoured, even though I earned a penny. That's how much we got paid. Really? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but would you, say, would you say that the album that really went bang was Architecture and Morality, which was the, what, the album after that? Was it, um, was it, rather, over, was it rather, feel rather strange to suddenly think everything that we're doing is getting better and better with every single yeah. thing that you're doing? Yeah. You've got to imagine mm. that unlike yeah. most bands throughout history, and certainly these days with the sort of X Factor wannabe thing, mm. we didn't want to be pop stars. And I say, we swore at Tony Wilson when he <laughs> told us we were the future of pop music. So we were completely accidental pop stars. I know this mm. sounds pathetically like a lie, but it's the truth. So. Everything we did went from being something our friends didn't like to yeah. people, people are buying it. Mm -hmm. People are buying a lot of it. Yeah. People are buying millions of it. And so, yeah, from one album to, to the third album, Architecture Maldi had three top five singles mm -hmm. in the UK. And it sold over three million globally. Mm. And it was just... And we were, we were doing it completely by our own rules. Yeah. You know, nobody told us what to do. Mm. We would just phone up the record company and say, right, we've written a collection of songs. We want to go into this studio with that person on that day. And they would go, OK. Nobody came and A&R'd us. Nobody told us what to do. Nobody made any suggestions. Mm. They just let us get on with it. I mean, it's hard to imagine that now. You know, the yeah. music industry is so running scared <clears throat> that they would have you screwed down tight and, oh, do this and do with that producer mm. and make this video and, you know, dress like this and cut your hair like that. We were just left to do what we wanted to, and we sold millions. It was bonkers, but yeah, it did. Yeah. It did lure us into a false sense of security. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one thing I was going to say is, um, was there sort of because architecture morality was so big, was there sort of a persuasion to then say, right, you're going to make architecture morality number two now, and sort of like stick to that formula with what became Dazzle Chips. Well, that's what the record company were hoping for. Mm. Um, in fact, they, they as much said, you know, make Architecture Melty number two. Mm. And they, they made the mistake of saying, if you just repeat this successful formula, yeah. well, first of all, it wasn't a formula. We were trying to do something new on every record. So that was their first mistake. The second mistake was, and the catastrophic mistake was, they said, if you repeat this formula, you could be the next Genesis. <laughs> and we were like, we don't want to be the next Genesis. 
I really don't like Genesis. <laughs> I don't want to become boring and middle of the road like them. Um, this, of course, was after, Gen after Gabriel had left Genesis. So, yeah. basically, I decided, more than Paul, I decided yeah. that we'd sold three million records and we still hadn't changed the world. Mm. We needed to be more radical, more political, more experimental. <laughs> So we set sail in the good ship Dazzle and kind of, it turned out that the world was flat and we went right <laughs> off the edge. <laughs> Would you say it was more of a strip, stripped down album compared in terms of like yeah. bare bones, yeah. purist sort of? Yeah, yeah. yeah we, 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 we consciously left the intellectual concept more mm. nakedly exposed. Admittedly, we were having difficulty as well. There was a sort of uh, creative block going on as well. It was a struggle to make that album, but we were determined to do something radically different mm. to architecture. The whole point, in my mind, yeah. of making a new record was to do something you hadn't done before. Mm. Specifically not to recreate what you'd done. I mean, and that's why, you know, it's funny really because several generations of people now if they've heard of the band mm. they've heard of the hit singles yeah and they just you know they've, you've heard them on the radio and they, they just hit singles you don't understand the context within which they entered the charts mm. and they were quite weird you know they were unusual now in hindsight they're just hit so people don't know that our first four albums were really quite I'm really proud of them because they walked mm. a tightrope yeah. between actually being really bloody weird, <laughs> but having one or two Stonewall melody songs on there that just couldn't be denied as singles. And it wasn't intentional. We didn't mm. sit down and go, right, today we're going to write the hit. I guess somewhere when we were 12, that glam rock of, you know, Gary Glitter and Slade and T-Rex mm. or something had crept into our minds uh, when we were kids watching Top of the Pops in 1972. And isn't there sort of doing, it being, rec being said as a, as, a, as a masterpiece and this whole sort of the whole Dazzle Ship weekend, See that, would you say the Dazzle Ship weekend was the perfect sort of sealing of the envelope and saying this is the perfect way to sort of, to, as a tribute to it and to mm. say that it was to sort of, uh, to appreciate it? Well, it certainly shows that it's sort of its rehabilitation is almost complete. Um, I still wouldn't mind if it would sell another couple of million copies, <laughs> but it's never going to do that now. Um, it was wonderful. It was wonderful to mm. celebrate an album that, you know, 31 years ago almost ended our career. Because it's, it is good. I, yeah. At the time, I understand why it frightened people to death. Mm. It was fairly uncompromising. But you know, you guys are of a generation who've grown up with mashups and multimedia and multitasking and in this sort of chopped up, fractured world of mm. different media inputs and sources and everything's a recombination and a cut and a paste. And, yeah. and so you're used to that kind of fractured accumulation. In 1983, it was still quite radical. Mm. Would you say that it's sort of, it Sort of made you change your uh, sort of approach to, uh, to to junk culture, which was yeah. the album afterwards. Yeah. yeah, consciously and unconsciously, yeah. we definitely uh, reeled ourselves back in from the precipice in terms of, you know, the the, the, the <coughs> we were a lot safer. Mm. And is it true that you re that um, junk culture is being reissued? Mm. Yeah. It should have come out this year because it mm. would have been its thirtieth anniversary. But yeah. The record company has been a little bit tardy in getting its uh, act yeah. together, but also we have gone back to some of the multi tracks and found some tapes that were early okay. demos, and in fact, one song that was never even released before. So mm. we've got some tasty extras coming out next year. Fantastic. Um, and in the mid 80s, you um, started looking towards American, or you, was, you set your record, your uh, album Crush um, was very successful. In America, and you use you, what drew you towards Stephen Haig as a, as a producer. I think 
that was the beginning of record companies. Once we'd had our kind of running off the rails, mm. left our own devices, I think the record company got a little bit more circumspect about leaving yeah. us alone. So I think they suggested, oh, why don't you get in, you know, the producer who's having hits at the moment, Stephen Haig, you know, he's mm. working with the Pet Shop Boys and yeah. New Order. So we gave it a whirl and we did two albums with Stephen Haig, for better or for worse. That's all I'll say. <laughs> um, and you also wrote uh, the... Uh, song If You Leave, which was used in the Pretty in mm -hmm. Pink song. Um, how did you get the uh, the call? About that? Who who informed you about that? Uh, John Hughes, the movie director mm. and, the, and the writer, was a fan. Really? And he asked us to do it, and we went we we went to Paramount Pictures, and we went on set, and we met the actors, and he said, "This is the scene we want the song for, and can you write us one?" So we did, and then we took the tape to America to mix it, and he said, "Ah, like the song." But we've changed the end of the film. It doesn't work anymore. Can right. you do me another one? And we were like, well, we start a tour tomorrow. But uh, so we just right. went into the studio and off the top of our heads, we wrote the biggest hit we ever had in America <laughs> in one day. The biggest hit we ever had in America, mm. it didn't even get into the top 50 in the UK. And in the, of course, the, the 90s, um, you had, you had, how shall I say this, uh, you and Paul went your separate ways? Very diplomatically, yeah. yes we did. Um, did it feel weird doing it without Paul and Martin and Mel? Yeah. You've got to remember that particularly Paul and I had been working together since he was 15 and I was 16. Yeah. But all I'd ever known was Paul and then Martin and Malcolm uh, throughout, the throughout the 80s. So, yeah, it was frightening as well as mm. weird. And in fact, it's noticeable that on the Sugar Tax album that I released, my yeah. first one without those guys in 1991, mm. my name does not appear on the album. I was hiding behind the corporate... M and D, mm. and even my picture was kind of like that, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, I was definitely, yeah, it was mm. strange and terrifying. But you also you equalled Mr. Humphreys with uh, Sailing on the Seven Seas, which reached number three. Yeah, yeah, because we never had a number one single in the UK. Mm. So, Souvenir, written by Paul, was number three, and Sailing on the Seven Seas, written by me, was number three. So, we've equalled each other now. <laughs> and uh, of course. What, um, what sort of brought the, uh, re the reform back together? Was it in 2006? Yeah. Um, in 96, at the height of Britpop, mm. a band that was perceived as an 80s synth band was really on yeah. the slippery slope. The you know, we, climate changing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we were struggling to be accepted. Yeah. Uh, Radio 1 wouldn't play us, Woolworths wouldn't even stock us, so you know, how, how could you get in the chart? Mm. Um, so it just seemed the opportune time to retire. Uh, and also my, you know, my uh, youngest kids had been born and I wanted to stay at home and mm. go on tour. So all seemed to... So I sort of retired from performing and went into writing and trying to sort of assist other people. Um, mm. But that got a bit painful after a while. Um, everybody is your friend when you're helping them, but as soon yeah. as you ask for something in return, <clears throat> yeah. they kind of go, oh no, oh, no, that's too much, can't do that. So um, after 10 years of working with other people and my mm. kids growing up, we just thought, well, I, I wonder if people are interested mm. in this. You know, we, we had had requests to play concerts. Yeah. And um, so we sort of put a toe back in the water and announced a few gigs and they sold out like that mm. so we thought okay well, there's an appetite here yeah. and yeah it's basically just snowballed over the last seven years and, uh, and you've also you've made uh, two new albums mm -hmm. since you've reformed the history of modern and uh, English electric well has there been sort of a you say there's a natural progression from uh, the history of modern to English electric in terms of uh, History of Modern was a sort of collection mm. of things we had lying around yeah. that were dusted off and 
and they were sort of in various OMD styles, if you mm, like. Yeah. I think English Electric was a more homogenous affair because it was primarily written all within the same time period, and yeah. we worked closely together on it, me and Paul. So the nice thing is that it's sort of, we've been allowed to go back to where we were. Yeah. We're not, you know, again, we're not, although we don't think we can change the world now. Um, but we don't have to... Um, we don't have to listen to a record company. Yeah. We don't have to sell records. Once again, we can just do it for ourselves. Yeah. And that's all we want to do. Uh, that yeah. can be a recipe for being completely self-indulgent. Mm. So it is dangerous. Yeah. But I think we're deluded enough to think that we're not being self-indulgent. Get your, work out which way you were going on that one, you know. it's. Um, I think English Electric, seem, people really seem to think that we were mm -hmm. back on form, really right back to the sort of yeah. cut, sort of cutting edge ideas and mentalities and the intellectual concept allied mm. with the songwriting that we used yeah. to have 30 years ago. So it's amazing what a bunch of old 50 year olds can do when you really want to. Yeah, it's a fantastic album. I actually, I do, I do own English Electric and I thought it was fantastic first Thank time you. I heard it. And uh, it's also, it's got this very, um, I love the sort of conceptual parts of it, like um, is there, there's a song, Our System, has that got sort of sounds from, is it NASA? Yeah, it's the yeah. sound of the Voyager spacecraft going through the, mm. um, going, going past Jupiter. And okay. uh, yeah, I mean, the, the lyrics are basically, it's, it's a typical McCluskey, you know, overblown metaphor for, you know, our system being our solar system and also our social system mm. and how here we are you know Voyager is now actually the furthest man-made object outside of us outside of our solar system apart from the person going up the stairs <laughs> there um, and and yet you know we can do that we can send this amazing spacecraft out mm. beyond the furthest planet and yet here we are on the world still completely fucked up and uh, what's, the, what's the plans for OMD now? Is there a new, uh, new album in the works? Yeah, we weren't sure after English Electric whether we could summon the energy and we were not going to force ourselves. This is, mm. We were definitely not going to make the mistake we made in the past of sort of feeling like we had to make a record. It's like, no, yeah. if the well is empty, if yeah. there's no desire, don't make it. You don't have to. We mm. don't have to make a record to put the bread on the table. Mm. So if there's nothing to say, don't say it. But we've started to get some ideas about things we want to say. So we're working on it. Don't know when it'll be, but Fantastic. we're working on it. And it has, so since you've got back together, is there sort of been the urge to do things that are completely different that you've never done before? Like there, you have performed with, like, with orchestras and such as like the Dazzle, Dazzle Ships performances mm -hmm. um, at the museum, it's certainly something I've I've never been to before, and it was it was a very it was a fantastic experience because it felt privileged that I was there because I felt in amongst hardcore OMD fans, and also I felt like I was the youngest one there. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't, but the, there were a few other young people there. But it, what's been interesting actually the last few years is to see, okay, understandably there's mm. a there's a solid base of people who've grown up with us, yeah, to whom. You know, we were a we were a part of their life experience, yeah. particularly when they were young. Particularly, people who liked the intellectual content of our mm. music, as well as the fact that you could dance to it and whistle the tune. Yeah, they liked the fact that we wrote songs about oil refineries and the universe and whatever it may be. Um, and I'm honoured that they came on that journey with us and allowed me yeah. to be completely self-indulgent and pretentious with my lyrical content. Um, but. There are several generations now, it's cascaded down, and it's hard yeah. to imagine it, because when I was young, mm. the idea of, well, like I said, with ZZ Top and older bands, it was like, get out of the way, yeah. you're clogging up the future. Um, but now, there are people who, you know, I guess there'll always be generations of people who do look for something a little bit more interesting than, mm. ooh baby, I love you lyrics, and yet another guitar solo. Yeah. And so there are those people will still seem to gravitate towards what we do, which is great. Mm. If you were to pick one song that you would say is your favourite OMD song, would you be able? To, what would you say is your favourite? 
Mr. Humphreys and I are different in almost every respect. <laughs> and yet we agree on one thing, our favourite OMD song. I'm excited now. <laughs> it is the one that we closed the show with last weekend. The ah. Romance of the Telescope That's is both it. of our favourite songs. Fantastic. But uh, final question. I know it's been a long one, but uh, what would you personally want the OMD sort of legacy to be? <clears throat> I would like, because I'm greedy, I would like people to think we could whistle the tune, we could go on the intellectual journey with them, and when we saw them live, they kicked ass. I would certainly agree with that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Andy, it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you. And Thank you. This experience has been fantastic, not only for me, but uh, but certainly... For your dad too, hello. <laughs> <laughs> but no, thank you very much, Andy. My absolute pleasure, thank you. Good